Okay, apologies for the late start. I'll um, try and speak a little bit faster to compensate. Um, okay, so uh, today we're looking at uh, Putnam on uh, meaning and reference. And uh, this general question Putnam has about whether your psychological states fix the references of your psychological terms. Um, and what I what I want <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> what I want to bring out today is that um, is something about the way in which causal theories of reference bear on our knowledge of our own psychological states. So I, I want to begin with some remarks about what for most of us is probably the, uh, the classical, the best known picture of your knowledge of your own mental states, Descartes, and then say something about how a causal picture of reference really blows up that kind of view of knowledge of your own mental states. So um, here's Descartes um, in the throes of his doubt. Uh, what, what shall I now say that I am? I mean, he, <laughs> you can hear he's a bit excited at this point. Um, what shall I now say that I am when I am supposing that there is some supremely powerful and, if it is permissible to say, malicious deceiver who is deliberately trying to trick me in every way he can. So the picture there is, you don't have any knowledge of the physical world at all. You don't have any knowledge of the world around you at all. It might all be a dream. It might all be a hallucination. You might have gone mad. There might be this deceiver getting at you. Um, so what can you say about yourself? What kind of knowledge do you have of yourself in that situation? Do you have any knowledge of yourself? in that situation. Well, it is, can I now assert that I possess even the most insignificant of attributes, which I have just said belong to the nature of a body. Um, so you don't, I mean, and obviously you can't, um, because if it's all a dream, if it's all a hallucination, then your body is just as much part of that hallucination as anything else. But still, he says, in such a situation, you still know that you exist. Um, and you still know, therefore, of some of your own characteristics. Um, so which of your own characteristics do you have knowledge of in that situation? And um, here in this famous passage, he says, At last I have discovered it, thought. Thought alone is inseparable from me. It might all be a dream. I might not know anything about what's going on out there. But still, I know about my own thoughts. I have some kind of special authority in my knowledge of my own mind. Um, so if you think what's going on here, you, it's being supposed that if you consider someone plunged in thought, then they might not have certain knowledge of what is going on around them. But still, when you look, when you survey your own mind, you first of all know whether you're thinking, and secondly, you know what you're thinking. And that's a very intuitive, appealing idea. Um, I'm, <laughs> I might not know much about what's going on out there, but still, surely I can r survey and know about what's going on in here. Um, now, knowing whether you're thinking and knowing what you're thinking, um, knowing whether you're thinking, well, if you don't know about what's going on out there, then you don't know whether your thoughts refer. Right? That's all right. If I don't know whether Sally exists, then I don't know whether my thoughts about Sally refer. Um, so if I know whether I'm thinking in this situation, then meaning doesn't depend on reference. Because my thought has significance, whether or not there's any reference for it. 
right? That's all right? Yeah, because the reference is something out there, something physical. Um, the meaning, the thought, is something you know about. Whether you're not, the physical is there. And if you know what you're thinking, then presumably you know if you have a thought here, now, and you have a thought then, then you know whether it's the same thought. If you know which thoughts you're having, then you must know whether it's the same thought you're having um, here as there, now as then. So knowing what, I mean, that's all, it must come to at least that. You know whether it's the same thought again. But if you have a causal theory of reference, if you have a causal theory as to what is giving content to the thoughts that you're having, then that challenges that picture. Because on a causal theory of reference, it's only the physical stuff out there that is giving significance to your thoughts. So if that stuff is not there, if you can't have meaning without reference, and the causal theory seems to suggest that you can't have meaning without reference, if there's no reference, then there's no causal chain and nothing to give meaning to your thoughts, um, then you're not, you don't actually have authoritative knowledge of whether you're even thinking. There might not be anything out there to be giving your thought causal significance if you can't have meaning without reference, as the causal theory suggests. And if, as I've suggested a few times, on a causal theory of reference, um, you can't really tell infallibly whether it's the same thought you're having again or not, because the sameness of thought requires the sameness of the object out there generating the thought. And, if you, uh, and you can't know about that just by surveying some internal domain any more than you can know just by surveying the pixels in two photographs, whether or not they are shots of one and the same thing. So the causal theory of reference really seems to blow up that picture of the mind as an internal domain that you can survey without having any knowledge of the physical world around you and have authoritative knowledge of um, independently of your knowledge of the physical world. Okay? I'll elaborate that point. I mean, that's putting it very abstractly and schematically. I'll try and give some examples um, in a moment, but that's just to state schematically the general connection between the causal theory of reference and what picture you have of your knowledge of your own mind. It really seems to blow up the De Descartes classical picture. I do think that's true. Okay? Straightforward enough? Yes? He knew more than he, he, he. so. Um, if this is Descartes, um, yeah, he, 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 just doing that, which is what Descartes doing, right? He's got his eyes shut, as you can see. Um, he's still uh, he's getting knowledge of more than his mind. Right. I see you might say that, um, and in fact you'd have to say that if you're going to hold on to Descartes' line. You could say, well, you couldn't really hold on to Descartes' line exactly because Descartes' line was, I give up my knowledge of the physical world, but I still have knowledge of what's going on in here. You're saying, um, I can get my knowledge of the physical world from my knowledge of what's going on in here. That seems a little bit weird, doesn't it? I mean, um, if you're just sitting by the fire, think, I mean, Descartes could have thought, I'm just sitting by the fire thinking about Sally. But I couldn't be thinking about Sally on the causal theory of reference unless Sally existed. So Sally must exist, right? You were wondering if Sally was merely imaginary, if she was just one of your constellation of imaginary friends. 
And then you thought, no, I couldn't even have this thought on the causal theory of reference unless Sally existed. So Sally must exist. Did you say metaphysical causation? Yes. Uh huh. Right. Causation in itself, yes. Yeah. That's right, that's right. The, the causation itself is what's required for knowledge. But the causal theory of reference seems like a kind of a priori theory. Yeah, I mean, Descartes could just have read Kripke. You, you see what I mean? He said, boy, that's right, the causal theory. Therefore, given that I know um, that I'm thinking about water, there must be such a stuff as water. It can't all be a dream. <laughs> okay. I'm just stating it. Um, I, I actually think that's an important view, and, and I actually mean to discuss that line next ne next time. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I think it's an important line of reasoning to pursue. Okay. Okay. Um, so I. I want to cut to another part of the forest for, uh, for, for a second and um, look at what Putnam says about natural kinds and then look at how um, a Putnamian or Kripkean theory of names of natural kinds bears on these points about self-knowledge. Um, I also want to, when I come to this section three, I, I want to suggest a slightly different way of reading Putnam to the way I had last time. Um, I think both these strands of thought are in Putnam's article. Um, but, so I, I, I already set out one, but I'll set out the other now. Okay, what's a natural kind? The idea of a natural kind is the idea of a distinction that's out there in the world independently of what anyone thinks. So some classifications are projected onto the world by us um, out there in the real world there's just a whole bunch of atoms buzzing around and lots of the distinctions that we make between different kinds of collections of atoms are just projected by our own interests. Um, uh, I mean, the, the distinction between something that's interesting and something that's not interesting is presumably entirely relative to what your interests are. It's a projection of your own interests onto the world out there. Yes? That's okay. Um, but then you think, well, there are classifications of the world out there that don't depend on any of us in that way. And really isn't what science is doing, is trying to discover what distinctions there are in the world out there, independent of any of us, independent of you or me. So the idea of a natural kind is the idea of a classification that's out there in the world independently of us, and we are just trying to get on onto it. I mean, when scientists make, made a distinction between things that have electrical charge and things that don't have electrical charge, they weren't uh, saying, well, we find this, we, we project this onto the world. They were saying, that's out there, and we are trying to find out about this distinction. Um, so for a distinction like that, how you find out about it is one thing, and what it is intrinsically is another. It's not your interests that determine what the distinction is. Rather, the distinction's out there, and you're trying to get onto it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so, uh, the general picture I suggested for natural kinds last time was... Um, you have a set of symptoms, as with a disease, you have a set of symptoms of being this kind of thing, and then you postulate there's some underlying structure, some, something out there in the world, independent of you, that is producing those symptoms. So um, I gave that example of gold in Archimedes, where uh, Archimedes takes it for granted that 
What it is for something to be gold is not a matter particularly of how it strikes anyone, how it looks. Um, it's a matter of having the structure that typically underlies that kind of behavior, the behavior that gold things exhibit. Solubility, ductility, uh, solubility in aqua regia, um, ductility, malleability, and so on. Um, all the stuff that gold does. There's something out there that explains that. We don't know what it is, but we assume that there's some structure out there in the world. And similarly for all the chemical substances, and presumably for lots of names of substances and lots of names of animals. Um, so you usually think of the essence of a substance as a characteristic that explains the symptoms by which we usually detect the presence of the kind. So there's that rough common sense folk notion of gold or of what it is to be a tiger. Um, but we don't take that as definitive. We assume that something could have all those characteristics but not really be gold or not really be a tiger. Um, and even if we don't actually know what the essence is, you can improve your use of the symptoms by which you test for its presence. I mean, Archimedes found a better test for the presence of gold if you're a physician looking for um, cases of Legionnaire's disease, you might not know what the virus is that produces Legionnaire's disease, but you might think, well, um, uh, maybe there's a presence of a particular hormone in the body that actually really indicates that, that, that you have Legionnaire's disease. You might think you can find better and subtler symptoms of having Legionnaire's disease, even though you don't know yet what the particular virus is. So the, um, how should I say, the poster child, the uh, paradigmatic example of this kind of thing is chemistry and the periodic table. Um, so the periodic table is important because of the periodic law and the periodic law says the chemical properties of an element are a periodic function of its atomic number. So what that's telling you, what that seems to be telling you is if you want to know what the outward properties are of, a sub of an element, uh, the way the thing behaves, the way the thing behaves seems to be dictated by its atomic number. Right? So if it's exhibiting um, all these uh, particular S1 to S4, then you say the atomic number is what drives that behavior, that the element behaves the way it does. Um, so that seems to give you a very clear case of this kind of thing at work. You can say with gold, it looks like, for all the properties that we're interested in of gold, if you ask why does it have those characteristics, why is it soluble in aqua regia, then um, ultimately the answer is going to have something to do with it having the particular atomic number it does. So that seems to give you a very clear case where here are all the substances and there are all their essences um, cleanly laid out um, in a structured table. Um, you could push it a little bit further and say that works for compounds too. On Earth, what's playing that role is um, the H2O molecule. That's what explains why water dissolves stuff, uh, has the boiling point and melting point that it does, and so on. On Twin Earth is XYZ that explains why the substance has those characteristics. Um, that's why we say it's a different substance on Earth uh, than on Twin Earth. It's a little bit more complex when you start talking about biological kinds, I mean, um, the, the, the names of animals. If you take tiger and say, well, something behave, well, why do, suppose you have all the characteristics of being a tiger, which um, I'm not really an expert, but I, so <laughs> I assume that they include these ones, right? Um, um, and you say, well, why is it that this uh, thing exhibits these characteristics? Uh, I guess the DNA structure has something to do with it. But with biological species, it's not nearly as clean cut as it is with um, chemistry. There's no biological analog of uh, the periodic table. You don't get all the species nicely laid out in some uh, great hierarchy like that. Um, and in fact, DNA structure alone can't possibly be what does it. Because the notion of a species has a how should I say, a kind of historical component to it, so that um, it has to do with members of the species 
all being sprung from the same stock, all having a, a, a same, the same kind of history, um, having been generated. For, uh, I mean, tigers on Mars that exhibited this kind of structure had that very DNA. They still wouldn't be tigers. At the best, they'd be Martian tigers. They're not real tigers. They're a different species than Earth tigers. They have nothing to do with them evolutionarily. So even in biology, um, the case is a little bit more complex than it is in chemistry. It's harder to know just how you'd pin down and say what the essence of a biological kind is. Um, it's not good enough just to, I, I mean, DNA structure might vary between members of the same species. And after all, a species can split into two. So a straightforward histo historical picture of what's going on with biological species doesn't sound very plausible either. But on the other hand, when you talk about a species like tiger or a, a elephant or whatever, then um, you're not just talking about whatever has these outward characteristics. You're not just saying if it's stripy, got claw, if it, what is it, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck and all that, then it is a duck. That's really not true. I mean, um, the, 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 that's the point about that remark. It's just false. Uh, you could have something that ex looked for all the world like a duck, but was just not a duck. It, it, it didn't spring from the right stock. It didn't have the right kind of um, biological material in it. If it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, but it's actually made of metal and built in Taiwan, then it is not a duck. Um, uh, uh, you see what I mean? We, d we just don't use the notion of a duck like that. Um, and similarly, you could have a, a tiger that was not at all ferocious, or didn't have, three, didn't have four feet, um, didn't have claws, wasn't, wasn't striped. Yeah, so we, we don't actually treat tiger or duck or these other notions as if they just have to do with the superficial characteristics that everybody knows about. We talk as if tiger or duck are pointing you to some internal structure that we don't yet know about, even though it's very difficult to say what it is. I and mean, whatever you say exactly about the biological species, they're very different to classifications like um, beautiful or well-designed, cool, or gives me a strange ripply feeling. Um, I mean, if you, think, if, if, you, if you take a classification like gives me a strange ripply feeling and ask, well, could there be a ringer for that? Could there be something that... Um, it strikes me just like something that gives me a strange Ripley feeling. I get all the Ripley feelings all right, but it, it's not, it doesn't really get, give me a strange Ripley feeling. That, that doesn't make any sense. You, you see what I mean? With classifications like that, um, there isn't any hidden essence. There isn't any underlying structure that's the thing you're really talking about. Um, you're not even trying to get at that. You can't have something that... Um, really looks just like something beautiful, is a dead ringer for something beautiful, but it's not really beautiful. How could that be? Yeah, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, so classifications like that aren't natural kinds. Classifications like uh, the names for biological species, they don't have that nice, tidy structure of the periodic table, but in our ordinary thinking about biological species, we're trying to get at something like that, something out there independent of us. Psychiatric classifications are a really interesting, um, uh, difficult case here. Um, I take schizophrenia, uh, take the classification as someone is schizophrenic or not schizophrenic. Is that a concept where it would be like, right to say if it looks like a duck and talks like a duck and so on, then it is a, it, it is a duck? I mean, the symptoms of schizophrenia, there's a usual list, things like delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, um, a disorganized behavior, uh, flattening of affect, um, just not, not, not um, being very excited about anything, a kind of passivity. Uh, well, would it be right to say that that's what schizophrenia is? That anything that exhibits those characteristics, that's what we mean by a schizophrenic patient? Well, actually, nobody talks like that. Nobody thinks that you can um, define schizophrenia in terms of, well, nobody's a strong word. Most people don't think you can define schizophrenia um, 
just in terms of these explicit behavioral signs and say anything that exhibits them, that's, what, that, that, that's a schizophrenic. And if you don't exhibit just those signs, then you're not a schizophrenic. These are, at best, guides to whether someone is a schizophrenic. But on the other hand, I mean, people have sometimes had the dream that when we know enough about the brain, it will turn out that there's a set of uh, brain structures um, like uh, having brain disturbance 34, having brain disturbance 33, that will be a kind of periodic table of um, the psychiatric disorders where you can look at all these different brain disturbances and see them arrayed on a kind of periodic table of the things that can go wrong with your brain with these uh, kinds of symptoms being seen as the consequences of that. And that doesn't seem actually to be um, at all what is going to happen. It's a very untidy picture of uh, what is going on, what, what, what is different about the brain of someone with schizophrenia uh, from, from a, a, a healthy patient, a healthy person. Um, and there, is, there just isn't going to be some nice structure there as you get with the periodic table. That seems to be a fantasy. So these are very difficult cases, psychiatric disorders. Our ordinary talk seems to want to point to something beyond the outward symptoms and say, but this is what it is really. Um, but on the other hand, when you say, well, what is the underlying virus going to be? What is the underlying structure going to be? It doesn't seem right to say there's going to be any underlying structure, any uh, organized underlying structure there. So the, the distinction between natural kinds and things that are not natural kinds, is, uh, there are lots of very difficult cases there. Um, chemistry in the periodic table is, the, is the, the, the clear case, the model that you wish everything else was like but everything else <laughs> doesn't live up to the model. Um, but on the other hand, there is certainly something right about that picture of a set of symptoms for which we want to find something distinctive underlying them. One way to think of it is that um, if you've got a natural kind notion, then uh, it should be possible to make predictions. I mean, with um, suppose you take that example that came up last time of mud um, can you, if you know a bit about mud and you say, well, all the mud I've encountered so far has been um, in Berkeley, then um, could it possibly be right to do an induction and say, well, therefore all mud is in Berkeley? I mean, it doesn't make sense, right? I mean, the characteristic... Mud, <laughs> How should I say that? There's nothing deep about, well, <laughs> that's not quite what I mean. Um, there's nothing deep about mud. I mean, because of course there sometimes is. But um, what I mean is um, being mud is just a matter of having certain superficial characteristics. And you're not going to get any generalization about what's true of all mud beyond the possession of these characteristics. Um, on the other hand, if schizophrenia, well, let me take water as a clear case. If you get a generalization about water, like all the samples of water you've encountered um, boil um, at uh, whatever it is, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, if all the samples you've encountered so far boil at that temperature, then you can generalize and say all water will boil at that temperature. You can't do that with mud. If all the mud you've encountered so far did happen to boil at a particular temperature, that might just be an accident. Mud is really a kind of heterogeneous classification for all different kinds of stuff that behave in the same kind of way. Um, part of the point of trying to classify psychiatric disorders is that if you can get them organized as natural kinds, which is what people are trying to do basically, if you're trying to get them organized, not just in, uh, so that they're classifications, not just of the way things strike us, but of the distinctions between patients that are out there in the world, then you should be able to do inductions and say, this treatment worked on this patient, this treatment worked on this collection of patients, therefore very likely this treatment will work on them all. You want to be able to generalize from what goes on with a small sample to what's going to go on with um, all or at any rate the good majority of patients. Um, and if you uh, know something about how the, uh, how the disorder came about, 
in a particular bunch of patients, you should be able to generalize and say, well, very likely, this is how it comes about for all or most patients. Um, so w one way to think of the importance of the classification is in terms of whether induction is possible, whether you can generalize from a small sample to the behavior of the whole. Okay. So this is an important distinction, it seems to me, but um, there's a lot of uh, unclarity in how you apply it in particular cases. That's kind of my picture of what is going on when we talk about a natural kind. When Putnam was writing, of course, um, the subject was relatively new in recent philosophy. Uh, and he, I think it's fair to say, he takes it that chemistry is actually the general case, um, that you get nice, tidy essences for everything. Okay. Comfortable with that? You don't have to agree, but you, you see what the idea is. Okay, um, so l I just want finally to um, say something about another way of reading Putnam than the way of reading I gave last time. I mean, the way of reading I gave last time is there in the text. I mean, it, it was quotes from the text. But there is another way of reading him um, that, it, that is also in the text, I think. So we've got these natural kinds. There are classifications out there in the world independently of us. The substances, the species, all those things are out there, um, whatever we think of them. So you could think on this way, on the way of reading Putnam that I'm going to suggest now, which is much more like Kripke's view. Um, you might say, well, names for substances are logically proper names. A logically proper name was a name that didn't have any bits and pieces in it. I mean, uh, unlike a description, is not complex. A name is simple. You uh, uh, give meaning to a name just by saying, I shall call this Bill. Um, I shall call this person Sally. You give meaning to the name just by dubbing an object with that name. So similarly, you could think a name for a substance is simple. Um, by gold, what you do, when you talk about gold, you're just dubbing um, a substance, you're just dubbing a kind. When you talk about water, you're just dubbing a kind. So what's going on is that these names for chemical substances, biological species, any physical phenomena like electricity, mass, um, what's going on is out there in the world there are these phenomena, mass, electricity, tigers, water, and what you do is you say, I'll dub this one water. I'll dub this one electricity. I'll dub this one mass. That thing out there is what you're causally responding to when you use the term. So um, the, terms, the terms for natural kinds here are working just the same way Kripke thinks proper names work. Kripke thinks when you get a proper name, you just got someone who's making you use that name. You got someone who's generating information about themselves, radiating it out into the community, and other people pick up on that and use that name to transmit the information that is being radiated out. So similarly, you could think that a kind is radiating information about itself out to you, um, and what you do is you respond to that radiation of information by using a name to pick up the information and transmit it to other people. So just as proper names represent in virtue of a causal relation to the subject, words for natural kinds represent in virtue of a causal relation to the subject. Now, this is different to the account I was ascribing to Putnam last time. The account I was uh, giving to Putnam last time was that um, a name like water is actually a description, meaning the stuff that bears same, same L to the liquid around here that falls from the skies, fills the rivers and lakes and so on. Um, so that last week I was giving a reading of Putnam on which is really, water is really um, a description, it's short for a description, the liquid uh, uh, 
bears same L to the stuff which falls from the rivers and lakes and so on. So that's a descriptive way of specifying the reference. Um, this is much simpler. This is just saying you encounter the stuff, you get into some rain, you say, I'll call that water. And it's a much, uh, there isn't that explicit breakdown of it into anything complex. Um, so you could say, I encounter these superficial symptoms of the underlying structure. My encountering those superficial symptoms, like it gets you wet, it quenches thirst, and so on, that is me being causally affected by the underlying structure. Um, so I exploit that when I use the name water. Someone in Twin Earth is exploiting it's the same symptoms, but they're being uh, caused to uh, uh, use the term by a different underlying structure. That's why the term refers to something different. So this really fits right in with um, the kind of progression from Frege to uh, um, Kripke. Um, where you start out thinking, well, a sign's got a sense and a reference, and the sense is going to be expressed by a description. Then you move with Russell to saying, well, there's got to be a class of names that are more primitive than descriptions. And then you move with Kripke to saying, well, maybe ordinary names are primitive names. They're rigid, and the reference is fixed by a causal chain. So you could think that terms like water, tiger, schizophrenia, maybe, they're like that too. Um, they are uh, more primitive than any description, um, and they're rigid, and their uh, uh, references are all fixed by causal chains. So names for natural kinds are going to be logically proper names on this picture. And the striking thing here is that once you have this conception of what's going on with these names for natural kinds, you're going to have problems with informativeness and signs that have meaning but don't refer. Um, because if what you've got is, uh, you've got to have the same causal chain in order to have the same sign, well, how, do you, how can you know about that um, except by knowing something, that, an empirical fact about the world that you have to learn? How can you know that the a priori, that the same uh, causal chain lies behind your two uses of a term? Um, and these points imply difficulties about your knowledge of your own mental states. The kind of difficulties that I began with for, um, uh, what was his name? Descartes, Descartes, dear old Descartes. Um, um, I mean, it's actually anticipating. You remember we had the st that affecting story of Spot? Spot? Dear old Spot, yes? Um, yeah, I mean, you remember the, um, the innocent family that was spared all his heartbreak and anguish by um, deception? Right? One Spot was substituted for another. Okay, if you're in that situation, if you're thinking, here I am thinking about Spot again. Dear old Spot, I was thinking about Spot only yesterday. Well, in that case, which thing you're thinking about may have shifted, though you didn't realize it. Yeah, I mean, that was the model of the story. Now, which thing you're thinking about when you're thinking about spot has shifted, though you didn't realize it, then you can't know whether you're having the same thought again just by doing the Rodin thing, just by uh, thinking, but just by reflection, surveying what's going on in your own mind. Because what's going, whether you're having the same thought again is not completely a matter of what's going on in your own mind. It depends on what's out there in the physical world. Um, Isaac Bashevis Singer had a, a, a story. Um, I'm actually relying on memory for this, but it's something like this. Um, about um, a man who sets out on a long journey from his village. And uh, uh, it's going to take him weeks to get to his destination. And every night, uh, outside his tent, he leaves his clogs pointing in the direction in which he's going. Um, and after he's been on the road for some considerable time, one night, someone turns his clogs around. And so he continues walking. And after many more weeks, 
he comes to a village and realizes that the world is even stranger than he thought it was. He says, good God, this looks just like my own village. These horses look just like the horses from my own village. This woman looks just like my wife. <laughs> it's unbelievable. So, there, now, suppose you ask him, are these really horses? He's perfectly within his rights to say, well, they might be, and they might not be. He's thinking about the very same things in the very same way. But he doesn't realize that he is. For all he knows, they might be different. He can't tell just by reflecting on the contents of his own mind that he is thinking about the very same objects in the very same way. When he's asked, um, is that woman the same woman that you, th you, you have thought about so often? He thinks no. And he can't tell that it is um, just by reflecting on the contents of his own mind. In his context, he's actually perfectly reasonable for him to raise the question. Isn't that a different person? Am um, I thinking about someone different here? So he's being presented with the very same people and things and substances in the very same ways. He's thinking the very same thoughts, but he doesn't realize that he is. He doesn't have authoritative knowledge over the contents of his own mind. So in these earth and twin earth cases, okay, this was Putnam's description, and I said, um, uh, well, if you were being swapped back and forth between earth and twin earth, then you wouldn't even realize what was happening, because it's so similar to this one. Um, but then, uh, if that was going on, you'd think you were having the same thoughts, but you wouldn't be. Yeah? And on the other hand, it could happen to you that, I mean, <laughs> some year we may do this as a class exercise. We take some individual and we say, there really is a twin earth, and we're actually going to fire you off there to see if what Putnam says is true. Kindly step into this box, and um, if you do this carefully enough, with enough stage setting, yeah, we might put you into the box, and then three minutes later, out you come, into the same old classroom, and say, by God, it's true. It's just exactly like the classroom I just left. Um, everything looks just the same. But of course, you say they're not the same people. It's not the same substance water here. Um, so I'm not thinking the same thoughts. But you are thinking the same thoughts. Yeah? So you might look out at um, this scene and that scene. Um, you look out at this scene uh, before you step into the box, you look out at the very same scene after you step out of the box, and you say, God, they look almost exactly identical. But I'm not having the same thoughts, because this, after all, is H2O, and this is XYZ, Z. You are wrong about that, yeah, because they're both H2O. But it's not a priori that you're wrong. You can't tell that you're wrong just by doing the Rodin thing, just by doing the Descartes thing. So if you fall asleep by the fire, and then you think, well, maybe it's all a dream, but I can still know which thoughts I'm having, it's not true. And if there's no water out there for you to be causing you to think those thoughts, then you're not actually having any thoughts at all. Okay, more of this on... Wednesday, thank you. <laughs> yeah.